The views and opinions expressed in the following podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the producers, the affiliates, or digital platforms hosting this podcast. All content is for the purposes of education, conjecture, and at times entertainment. We promote inclusiveness and diversity. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Into the Deep with Jay Costa. Welcome to Into the Deep. I'm Jay Costa. Trunks belonging to the genius inventor Nikola Tesla were confiscated by the United States government shortly after Nikola Tesla's death in 1943. Just before his death at the height of World War II, Nikola Tesla had claimed that he had perfected this so-called death beam. So it was natural that the FBI and other US government agencies would be interested in technology involving weaponry. Some were concerned that Tesla's papers might fall into the hands of the Axis of Powers, or the Soviet Union. Shortly thereafter, the assistant director of the New York FBI office exclaimed that they were vitally interested in preserving Tesla's papers, and representatives of the Office of Alien Property went to Nikola Tesla's room at the New Yorker Hotel and seized all of his possessions. What became of these technical and scientific papers after Nikola Tesla died? Well. In 2017, the CIA declassified many of these documents, and today's guest has got some answers. He's the author of more than 100 articles and a dozen books, including the acclaimed wizard, The Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. He's lectured at Brandeis University, Oxford, and a myriad of others. Today's guest is Mark Seifer. Mark is the preeminent authority on the life and times of Nikola Tesla. Mark's research and book was the catalyst for being approached by the History Channel to make a mini docuseries, The Tesla Files. So, join me as we seek light and journey into the deep with Mark Seifer. Enjoy. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. I can't thank you enough for your time and your energy and just what you bring, man. Okay, great. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind, I know who you are, but if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners and our viewers who you are and what it is you do, my friend. Yeah, my name is Mark Seifer. I'm a, a handwriting expert, also an expert on the life of Nikola Tesla. I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on him and trying to figure out why his name disappeared from the history books. I taught college for uh, about 40 years and uh, Retired from teaching, but I'm still writing. I've written a number of novels. Uh, this is the uh, first book that I wrote on Tesla. It's called Wizard, Life and Times of Nikola Tesla. And it's really covers a great deal of his life. Uh, but what happened in uh, 2017, Prometheus Films, Ancient Aliens and uh, Mystery Oak Island, those people called me and asked me if, they, if I wanted to star in a television show on Tesla. They wanted to use that particular book. And we had to come up with uh, you know, reasons uh, to have the show and the, the secret files of Tesla had a lot to do with it. And that resulted in, in this book. So I'm a writer, a handwriting expert, um, and a uh, retired college teacher. Right on. Well, thank you for your service, for helping you know educate others and, and bring light to others. It really is what it's about. Um, and that's, that's why I, you know, I'm super excited to have you here and like talk about Tesla and just, I, I remember hearing about Tesla at a young age, but only because my uncle had told me about Tesla, but I never learned about Tesla in school. So it's fascinating that you say you wanted to get to the bottom of why the name was eliminated from history books. What did you find out? I found out a number of things. Um, for instance, who invented, uh, the mouse? I don't know. I know Steve Jobs. Um, Who invented contact lenses? I don't know. I know Bausch and Lomb. So who invented the induction motor? At the time when I was a kid, I didn't know. I knew Westinghouse. Westinghouse had purchased the Tesla patents. So one of the reasons that his name disappeared was that many inventors, once they sell their patents, their inventions to a corporation, you know the name of the corporation, Apple Computer, uh, IBM, 
you know, and uh, and Westinghouse are three examples. Um, another reason was had to do with uh, him failing at Ordenclyffe, which was a huge tower that he'd built out on Long Island to uh, to send wireless communication. Tesla really is the inventor of cell phone technology. In 1900, he's telling J.P. Morgan, his backer, I can produce an unlimited number of wireless channels. Marconi at the time can only send dots and dashes, Morse code. His system could never have evolved into radio. You had to use Tesla's system. So Marconi eventually bought different patents and pirated stuff from Tesla. And that's how the radio developed. But Tesla ran out of money. So he came in second. We tend to forget who came in second. You might remember who won the Super Bowl, but who lost? You know, you remember winners. So that's another reason. And and a third reason was his belief that he'd received impulses from outer space that he thought came from Mars. In those days, the turn of the century, H.G. Wells and War in the Worlds, uh, Daphne du Maurier's grandfather wrote a book called The Martian. His name was George du Maurier. And Percival Lowell, who was the uh, brother of the, of the president of Harvard University, had a huge telescope out of Flagstaff, Arizona, not too far from where Tesla had a laboratory uh, in Colorado. And he was filming what he called the canals of Mars. Now, here you've got the, the uh, brother of the president of Harvard University uh, telling you that Mars is being irrigated by an intelligent species. So Tesla believed that when he received these pulse frequencies on his equipment, that he had gotten them from perhaps the Martians. Um, and of course, that drove his name uh, into the occult. And that's how it disappeared. So it disappeared for all those reasons. Ultimately, I think it disappeared because he failed in his wireless communication system. And that, and the reason that he failed, I think, ultimately was that Morgan pulled the funding. So he's never able to complete it. And he was an all or nothing guy. I was going to do the whole thing or, or nothing. Uh, so that's really why his name disappeared. Interesting. You know, and obviously there's all kinds of theories out there. You know, some some say there was sabotage at play or things like that. Like what what are your thoughts or maybe your insight on that? Well, how do you send messages through the air, let alone pictures? I'm the first uh, TV generation. I grew up in the 1950s. It's magic, isn't it? You send pictures through the air. Our little, our cell phones, this is magic, you know, that I can call and, and, and FaceTime with you or FaceTime with somebody in Australia or China or any place else. It's magical. But it's magical for us, and we understand the, the, the technology. Can you imagine at the turn of the century when barely anybody even has electric lighting? And Tesla's saying, I can send voice pictures and power by wireless. Morgan, uh, you know, wasn't sure that, he, that Tesla was correct. Um, and on the other hand, Tesla had a wireless system. Morgan had rubber plantations in Africa. He had copper mines out west. He had lumber yards. He wanted wires. Um, we have computers now to tell us who makes phone calls and whatever. And Tesla's trying to tell Morgan that the money's going to come in in a different way. It'll be on the sale of equipment. And of course, we now know through advertising. I mean, look at, I'm just, I love football. You know, I just read uh, one of these football players is getting, I think, $250 million. Uh, a, a linebacker can get $70 million. Where's all that money coming from? It's coming from advertising. It's coming from a uh, mass communication system that Tesla was trying to inaugurate in 1900 instead of in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, which is what really happened. So was there sabotage? Yes. Morgan, I prove uh, in both books uh, that Morgan scuttled uh, the deals that Tesla was having. When he, when he ran out of money, he went to other investors. Now, Tesla was living in the Waldorf Astoria in the 1890s and the early 1900s. This was the most posh hotel in all the world, and millionaires lived there. One of them was Henry Clay Frick. Frick was given $60 million from J.P. Morgan in 1901 when U.S. Steel was created. Carnegie was his partner, and Carnegie got like a $320 million. Frick got $60 million. And I discuss in this book the letters between Tesla and Frick. And Frick is saying, you know, how come Morgan is not giving you all the money you need? And Tesla reveals for the first time in any writings what you know what, what he says. He says, Morgan promised me $150,000, which was true. And he said he was never going to give me another cent. And he's a man of his word. So he said, you know, Morgan's a man of his word. Meet with Morgan. And I need another 100000 which is pocket change for somebody who's got $60 million. 
and I, I'll complete it. So, te- so Frick meets with Morgan and the deal never goes through. Uh, Morgan meets with uh, Thomas Fortune Ryan, another billionaire in those days, uh, the Tesla that winds up, deal doesn't go through. Jacob Schiff, another one, the deal doesn't go through. So it's clear that Morgan is scuttling the contract. And the reason he's scuttling it, I think is two reasons. Uh, number one, he hated to be wrong. He wasn't sure if Tesla really could do what he said he could do. Uh, how do you send pictures and, and voice through the air? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, and the other reason was it threatened his prevailing, uh, you know, systems of uh, selling rubber and, and copper and wire. And he didn't have a bill in a wireless. So in that sense, there was uh, treachery. Another area, uh, Jay, which is very interesting, which I uncovered, and that is in fluorescent lighting. Uh, Tesla also attaches fluorescent lighting to the Morgan patents. And um, fluorescent lighting didn't come into the 1940s. And the only reason it came in is because the demand for electricity was so great, they had to use fluorescent lighting. But Morgan and those kinds of people wanted us to have built-in obsolescence. You all remember, you know, you turn the light bulb, you burn your fingers. Light bulbs were producing heat and they lasted six months, eight months, maybe a year or two if you're lucky. I have fluorescent light that I keep over the the, uh, uh, the sink. It lasts eight, 10 years, and I never shut it off. Um, and that's who Tesla is. So there's another example where treachery really was afoot and where uh, a better technology was thwarted uh, because of uh, selfish concerns of uh, the money men. It's so, it, it baffles me where, you know, we can be on the precipice of something that can help humanity and yet, we seemingly, not everyone, but you know, generally, folks will reject these ideas or they'll reject technology because it's either unfamiliar or maybe they feel threatened by it and it undermines maybe their profit margin. But yet it's something that can move the needle. And yet, for whatever reason or another, people won't do it. Yeah. You know, when Tesla first came in, which was in the late 1880s, there were... Uh, it was called the direct current. Tesla had an AC system. Um, what Tesla knew about electricity was electricity by its nature changes its direction of flow at thousands of times a second. So think of a trying to get a water wheel to go in one direction. If the water goes down and then up and then down and up at thousands of times a second, how can you make the water wheel go in one direction? Nobody could do that. So they use direct current. They remove the upflow and only use the downflow. But the, but what happened in those days was that electricity could only then be transported about one mile power dropping off of a distance only for lighting, not for running a toaster or a vacuum or any of that kind of stuff. So I live in the Northeast. You live in the Northeast. You know where all the old factories were. They're all next to the river. Right. There's no factories 500 feet off the river. They're right on the river because you had to be that close to the river before Tesla came along. So in the war of the currents, AC versus DC, Edison versus Westinghouse, uh, uh, Edison was electrocuting cats and dogs, a horse, and even an elephant, and appearing at the trial of William Kemmler, who uh, axed his his, uh, wife to death or his mistress to death, and he was going to get the electric chair, and, and Edison uh, testifies how to kill somebody with AC. You stick your hands in water and you put the AC through the head and you, you, you kill them. Um, so it was that much animosity. And Westinghouse, caught in that battle, was saying, I can't pay you this royalty. We're, we're, we're losing money left and right in legal camp- campaigns against uh, Edison. Um, I just can't pay you. So Tesla rips up his royalty contract, says, you've got to go with AC. Now, the difference between AC and DC was in, at that time, in the 1880s and early 1890s, there were 3,000 coal-operated power plants all over the Northeast. That's just in the Northeast in, 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 in America, all spewing coal up into the atmosphere uh, to, to light homes in distances of just one mile. So if you wanted to light a larger city, you need four or five of these, these power plants. With one uh, clean uh, renewable energy system, hydroelectric power system at Niagara Falls, you could light up the entire Northeast for hundreds of miles, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Hartford, 
and run factories way off the river. You didn't have to be in the river. You just had to get a power line. And it was clean energy. Tesla called that running on the wheel work of nature. And I think he should be credited as the single most important person for helping to slow down global warming. Because had he not come along at that moment, we would have been so entrenched in DC and so entrenched in coal operated uh, pollution. Uh, so Tesla's idea and his goal, and one of his close friends was John Muir, Muir Woods, the guy who came up with Yosemite Park and all that, was to live within nature. How can we use advanced technology to live within nature and use renewable and not sap the, the, the world of its coal and, and, uh, and, and oil? And we're facing that right now, the whole idea of climate change. Um, I always felt it never mattered whether Al Gore was right or not. Uh, it's stupid to pollute the earth. I mean, it's stupid to pollute the atmosphere. Right. So the fact that it became a political argument was, was also ridiculous. It didn't matter if he was right. Obviously, it makes much more sense to have a clean, renewable system as opposed to running on oil or, or coal if you can avoid it. And that's all that, that that's all about. I agree wholeheartedly. And that's why I feel like I'm grateful that at least within the past decade or two, more and more folks, thanks to people like yourself, are finding out about Nikola Tesla and what he really brought to the table and how, to your point, really change the trajectory. And I mean, credit where credit's due. And I, I feel like still doesn't get enough credit. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my hero was Jacques Cousteau. Yes. <laughs> and the reason why, it, it, besides the fascination being under the water, I hope people that are listening go snorkeling, particularly in the Caribbean, places like that. I mean, it's just a whole other world. And he would take you snorkeling, essentially. But he used high technology. He used the most advanced technology to learn to live within nature. Tesla is of the same uh, uh, mindset. And John Muir, one of his closest friends, helped create the Sierra Club with, with his other good friend, uh, uh, Robert Underwood Johnson, uh, the editor of Century Magazine. Um, so there was that enlightenment all the way back, and you know, I'm sure all the way back, but certainly at the beginning of, of our modern age, you had those people leading the way, Teddy Roosevelt setting up all these, you know, uh, places where you, where you couldn't uh, have industry, um, the parks. Um, so, so I think he's important for that reason alone, just as a symbol of how can humanity progress, um, you know, without polluting the earth, and, and I think also limiting the population. I think we have to think about not having seven kids. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, we should think about uh, the future of this planet. How, we are stewards of the planet. Um, and, he, and he's a symbol of that. Aside from the fact he's so, his life is so fascinating, and gets more fascinating as he goes through it. But, but that alone is so important to, to tell, uh, you know, our kids and our grandkids that, that message. I wholeheartedly agree with that as well. I think one of the heartbreaking things is just the end of Nikola Tesla's life. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's really heartbreaking because of all he's really given us. And we're still, we're reaping all the, the benefits from his mind and his soul and his passions. And, and yet, you know, it just, it feels unjust and it feels wrong that somebody would have to spend their last few years like that. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the biggest things I learned in, in the new book, Tesla, Wizard at War, is that the image that we had of Tesla in his later life uh, is incorrect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in the 1930s, um, World War II was about to happen. Uh, Germany was getting more and more powerful. Um, they took over you know, Czechoslovakia they, and they eventually invaded uh, Poland. Um, and we had treaties, you know, uh, France and, and England had treaties with Poland, but they backed off and they, they didn't really stand up for the Poles at that moment. And then Germany invaded France. And you have all this happening. And in, in, in the run up to that, there was the fear that whoever got the atom bomb would uh, win the war. Um, and Tesla had what was known as a particle beam weapon. Now, I knew about all that in the first book that I wrote, Wiz Wizard. Uh, but I learned a lot of new details after I was in this television show called The Tesla Files. It, the Tesla Files went out to 40 different countries. People all over the world contacted me. One person who contacted me 
sent me information, his name is in, is in the book, uh, of Soviet Union declassified documents. Now, I knew Tesla had sold his particle beam weapon to the Soviets for $25,000 in 1934. Uh, I'm old enough that re to remember when a, 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 a candy bar was a nickel. Um, and uh, an ice cream sundae was a lot of money. It was 35 cents. That was a great deal of money. But in 1934, you could feed a whole family for a dollar. That's how you could buy a, you know, a corned beef sandwich for a nickel. I mean, that's uh, so when he got $25,000 in 1934, that's at least a half a million dollars in today's dollars, maybe a multiple of that figure. So he was getting a great deal of money. And what I found out was that Joseph Stalin himself had to okay that deal. Now, why did Tesla sell a particle beam weapon to the Soviet Union? In 1934, Franklin Roosevelt had opened up uh, trade with the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union was trading with Ford and General Electric and, and uh, many major companies. So it was okay. I mean, I, I personally don't think you should have sold them a weapon, but it was okay to have uh, that, that kind of commerce with the Soviet Union at that particular moment in time. So in my research, I knew he was also dealing with the uh, British uh, War Office, and he was trying to protect Great Britain from an invasion by uh, Germany. And he said, if you get my particle beam weapon, my death ray, and you set up a bunch of these at 200 mile intervals, you will protect the, the, uh, uh, the island of Great Britain from any f invasion by air or by sea. Um, and in my uh, readings through the, these uh, letters from the, you know, the Tesla Museum, he, one of the generals in Great Britain mentions General McNaughton. Well, let me give this to General McNaughton. And then the letters continue on and on and on. I'm going, who the heck is General McNaughton? Do you have any letters from General McNaughton? Oh, yeah, we got letters from General McNaughton. <laughs> well, General McNaughton was the head of secret weapons development for the Canadian government in essence, for the whole British Empire. You know, there are photographs of him sitting next to Winston Churchill going over maps together. He was third in line to become head of allied forces after Eisenhower, who, who got the job, and Mountbatten. He was the head of Canadian forces in uh, Europe during the war. And there are multiple letters between Tesla and uh, General McNaughton in the late 1930s, where Tesla, it, where McNaughton wants to understand how his particle beam weapon it works. So here we see Tesla, and I agree with you, we have this image of Tesla, this old man feeding the pigeons and disappearing. But when you get into the heart and soul of what's really happening, that's not really what's happening. That's one side of it. He's negotiating with Joseph Stalin. He's negotiating with the guy third in line to head allied forces for uh, the for the allies during World War II. He's negotiating with Franklin Roosevelt's people. We located a letter signed by Franklin Roosevelt wanting to meet with Tesla uh, in 1943 at, at the height of World War II. And the reason why was the fear that if the Germans built the nuclear weapon before we did, how could America protect itself from Germany sending with a V2 rocket over the, the atmosphere, skipping along the ionosphere, landing in New York? Would we need Tesla's death ray? And they're really thinking seriously about that. So I found out that Tesla is negotiating, not with second tier people, but with the very highest of echelons all through his entire life, even in while he's in his 80s, even as he's old, uh, physically uh, decrepit man, he'd been hit by a, a cab in 1937, never totally recovered from that. But that's what that's what this book is all about, uh, is, 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 is uh, what's going on on the other level. That's, the thing about him for me is, you know, the, the War of the Currents and that whole story with Edison is a great story. Marconi, uh, you know, uh, wireless is a great story, and that's in there too. But but he just gets more and more interesting as he goes through, even right up until literally, literally the day he dies. Because that letter from Franklin Roosevelt was written three days before Tesla died, wanting to meet with Tesla. Wow. Incredible. And here he is, you know, being one of probably at that time, the most sought after brilliant mind just to, like you said, try and solve a possible world crisis. And there he is living in a, a hotel and no one really knows that backstory. No, not at all. Uh, 
and you know what I wanted to do, I wanted to learn um, uh, about the the atom bomb. So I got the book, uh, the, the building of the atom bomb by uh, Richard Rhodes, and he's nice enough. He's reading my book. He said he won a Pulitzer Prize for his book. It's a great book about the making of the atom bomb, and um, in it he talks about Vanny Bush. Vanny Bush is the head of the Manhattan Project. He was the dean of MIT, um, and he. Uh, also started the Raytheon Corporation. What I discovered um, in writing Wizard at War is that in 1931, when Tesla turned 75, six or seven Nobel Prize winners sent Tesla happy birthday cards, including Albert Einstein. There was another one that came from MIT and the signature is scribbled and there's no typing on it. So no one knew who it was <laughs> until I came along. And it's Van Eva Bush. Van Eva Bush wrote Tesla, sent him a happy birthday card in 1931. He becomes head of the Manhattan Project. And two weeks before uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt writes that he wants to get the lowdown on Tesla, he wants to meet with Tesla, Bush meets with uh, Franklin Roosevelt and said, our people at Los Alamos think that the Germans are, are a year ahead of us. They think that they will get the atom bomb in 1942. Uh, I'm sorry, in 19, two years, 1944, and, and we will have it in 1945. Two weeks later, Roosevelt tries to meet with, with Tesla. So I uncovered a lot of information about Vanny the Bush. Vanny the Bush is the man who assigned uh, John G. Trump to look at Tesla's papers after Tesla died. And when we made the, the television show, The Tesla Files, I knew about the Trump report for 30 years, and of course I knew Donald Trump. They were the same name. It never occurred to me that there'd be any, any link between these two guys, but he's Trump's uncle. So it's uh so it, you know, th that whole thing, you know, it got revealed there. But there's a lot of stuff here on Vanny the Bush and on the secret negotiations that are happening of, of trying to figure out should we put our money behind the atom bomb or should we put it behind Tesla's particle beam weapon? Which way should we go? And and how should all that play out? It's when you start digging deeper and you start realizing <clears throat> who's connected to what and following that that trail or following the money, so to speak, too. I mean, now you you were granted access to a lot of this information. And was this in direct correlation to your involvement with the television sh uh, show or series? Is, is that where it came from or was it from outside of that? It's, you know, it's very hard uh, to do this kind of research. Uh, the Tesla Museum is in an odd situation. Mm. I've known uh, Dr. Br uh, Branimir Jovanovich for 30 something years, and, and he was certainly helpful. And so are the people at the Tesla Museum. But they're cagey, too. They don't give you everything. Sure. Um, for instance, um, uh, the letters from the British War Office. I asked for the letters for the British War Office. When I did the television show, Joseph Kinney, who was uh, the, um, uh, the head custodian of the Hotel New York or New York, gave me a, uh, a flash drive that had so much information on there. You could, like 10 Encyclopedia Britannica's worth of stuff on Tesla. <laughs> and one of them uh, was another letter from the British War Office uh, that, that Tesla wrote to the British War Office that they never gave me. Um, and I, I print the entire letter uh, in, in the book. Um, so, you know, why didn't they give it to me? Um, maybe got lost uh, or maybe, they, you know, they're just a, a mishap. But, you know, it, it was hard to get all that information. Um, but I've had I work with, uh, you know, top Tesla experts all over the world. And I could not have written this book without their help. Uh, the Corum brothers, uh, Jim and Ken Corum down in Texas, they have a wireless transmitter down there. They have given me a lot of information. Uh, another fellow in Slovenia has helped me uh, tremendously. That fellow who gave me the, the uh, Soviet documents. Um, it's partly because who I am and partly because of the success of this book. I'm frankly, I'm a hero in, in Serbia because of this book, because what I did, there was so much disinformation. And even today there's disinformation. I've been arguing with this guy from the IEEE saying Marconi's invented the radio. And it's like, he isn't. He, I mean, he deserves all the credit for bringing the radio out to the world, but he just isn't. He just, he had dots and dashes, Morse code. Um, and it's like you're rattling a cage. And that's just, you know, today. 
But I've been dealing with that all the way through. So when I wrote Wizard, the first book, and, and also this book, obviously, there were a lot of end notes where you see exactly where Cypher got his sources. So if you disagree, go back to the source, and then you got to disagree with the source. It's not really me. It, it's, it's where it came from. So, you know, you mentioned treachery. Uh, it's still occurring today. There's still a lot of disinformation uh, occurring. And uh, that's why I think it's so important to get of this book out. It's, it has not gotten uh, the, the reviews in the main places yet. And, uh, and I think part of it is, is this uh, residual prejudice that exists against it. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's important for people to realize that this book is important for a myriad of reasons. What do you think some of the motivation behind the even current misinformation that's still out there? I think uh, partly, um, you know, the, is Edison gets praised. I think Edison deserves all the praise he, you know, he should get. Um, uh, but they try to pit, you know, Edison and Tesla as enemies. They were for a period of time. Uh, but what I uh, got was all the letters between Tesla and Edison. They became friends. And in fact, when his uh, uh, lab burned to the ground, when Tesla's lab burned to the ground in 1895, Edison provided a laboratory for him until a new laboratory uh, could be built. Um, so I uncover a whole other thing, but I think that's part of it. Simplification. Let's make Marconi the hero. Let's make Edison the hero rather than get into the, the, the weeds and find out the real truth, uh, as to who really is, uh, uh, behind all these inventions. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a lot of people that have praised Tesla. He won the greatest geek ever against all, you know, everyone you could think of, including Newton and, uh, Leibniz and, uh, Leonardo da Vinci and, and Bill Gates and uh, Elon Musk and on and on and on. Um, the other thing though, on the positive side is of course, Elon Musk uh, kept the name Tesla Motors. He did not invent Tesla Motors. Um, one of the uh, uh, inventors of Tesla Motors uh, is reading my book right now, Mark Tampani. Uh, so uh, these two guys uh, uh, invented the, the electric car and the reason they invented the electric car was they wrote a, They read an article that Tesla wrote in 1904 that an electric car is a better way to go than the gasoline run motor. So that's why they named it Tesla Motors. And Musk was going to remove Tesla's name because he wasn't a Tesla fan. I think he is now. Right. Uh, but it was a close call. He almost removed his name from the, from the name of the car. Fascinating. Yeah, it, it's, I, I, it's enthralling because now you know, more and more folks are hearing the name Tesla because of Elon Musk. And my hope, and I'm sure you could probably align with this, is that people want to dig further and dig deeper and find out the origins of it so that they can find out what a brilliant mind started it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, he, I've been at it, you know, since the 1970s. And uh, I mean, he's not the only thing I do in life. I've written right. novels and yeah, pathology book and other books, uh, um, but he constantly triggers. I mean, he really is a genius. I mean, you know, the word is way overused, but this guy really was a genius. You should see the mathematical equations. There's a there's a major book written on Tesla right now that said he didn't even understand Maxwell's equations. Well, the guy who wrote this book, it's produced by Princeton University, obviously never looked at Tesla's papers. Um, it's a it's a great fake. This book. Uh, because anybody could say that Tesla didn't understand Maxwell's equations has never seen Tesla's, um, you know, actual notes where he's got uh, electrical, you know, it's, uh, to the 24th power and all this other kind of stuff. That, you know, I can't, I was a math, ma you know, math, uh, advanced math classes, but I can't understand the math that he, that he was involved in. Um, so he constantly fascinates me. One of his biggest secrets was something called his dynamic theory of gravity. And when I wrote the first book, I put in, I never mentioned that term, but I did put in a statement that Tesla made that the sun was absorbing more energy than it was radiating. And I, I don't want to put it in because it seems stupid. This, how could the sun be absorbing more energy than it's radiating? It's radiating so much energy. It's, you know, it's, you can't stand in front of the sun for long periods of time without being, and that's, 93 million miles away. It's giving off a hell of a lot of heat. <laughs> How could it be absorbing more than that? But over time, I began to think about it and think about it and really study. And uh, I did a tremendous amount of research in the last couple of chapters in Wizard Out War. I uncover what his dynamic theory of gravity is. Um, and it changes my whole view 
of what uh, of the fundamental structure of space is. And it's very easy to explain. What Tesla is saying is that matter is absorbing energy all of the time. So this mouse is absorbing energy. This thing is absorbing energy. This pen is absorbing energy. My glasses are absorbing energy. I'm absorbing energy. This chair is absorbing energy. And the earth is absorbing energy. But the earth is absorbing so much energy, the ether, all of the time that there's a constant influx. That's what gravity is. So the reason we fall back to the earth when we jump up is not because we're attracted to the earth, but because we're in the way of this influx. Now, Einstein spent the last 40 years of his life trying to combine gravity with electromagnetism, and he never could do it. Um, what occurred to me in the 10 years that it took me to figure out all of this was that if matter is absorbing energy all of the time, let's take it down to the electron. The electron is spinning. I found in a book called 30 Years That Shook Physics by uh, 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 George Gamow. Gamow is one of the people, you see Wolfgang Pauli, uh, Werner Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, uh, George Gamow, they're all sitting together. He's one of the founding fathers of quantum physics. He said that when Goodsmith and Uhlenbeck were measuring particle spin, they realized that particles were spinning faster than the speed of light. And the, we, the reason that they had to spin that fast, they had to spin that fast in order to generate electromagnetic energy. That's what his book says, 30 Years of Chugs Physics by George Gamow. I would say I talk about it in here. So I'm thinking about this and I keep reading Gamow's book and I like Gamow's book because I can understand it. He writes so that you can understand physics, which is a great talent. What he said was that it violated Einstein's theory of relativity because nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. So what Paul Adrian Dirac did, he came along and he said, instead of saying that the particle is spinning faster than the speed of light, let's use the square root of negative one, the imaginary number to stand for particle spin. Now, an imaginary number, a negative times a negative is always a positive. So there is no such thing as a square root of a negative number. That's what this imaginary number is. It was used in space time. At this, uh, time was used to uh, I, the imaginary number, to be equivalent to the three coordinates of space. And in the same sense, uh, Dirac said, let's do the same thing for particle spin. So we'll say the particle is spinning at the square root of negative one, and we'll make it equivalent to the other three positions of where the, uh, to tell you where the particle is when it's circling the nucleus. So by doing that, by getting rid of the problem that it's violating relativity and calling it the square root of negative one, an imaginary number, Dirac was able to combine Einstein's theory of relativity of quantum physics, and he got a Nobel Prize. And I think he deserves a Nobel Prize. I think it was a great achievement. But what about the very fact that the, a particle is spinning faster than the speed of light, and it needs to spin faster than the speed of light in order to generate electricity? Einstein spent 40 years trying to combine gravity electromagnetism. I just did right there. Because if the particle is absorbing uh, uh, etheric energy uh, at a tachyonic realm, or faster than the speed of light, and it's spinning, and it needs to spin that fast to generate electromagnetism, the absorption of the ether, ether by the particle is what gravity is. And transforming that energy into electromagnetism is combining gravity with electromagnetism. Um, I'm ready for my Nobel Prize. <laughs> you know? Man. I think I did it. I mean, I really do. And uh, uh, I know I'm, there's going to be backlash. Gonna, people are going to start screaming at me. There is no ether. And, uh, well, Einstein believed in the ether. I even quote a letter that he wrote, uh, uh, Lorenz, uh, that yes, I agree that there's an ether. And I, I take it from Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Einstein. So I think all the, the evidence is there. And that's what's so fascinating about Tesla. Tesla got me into, you know, solving Einstein's dream of grand unification. Um, that's how amazing he really is. Man, just the, just the way he's been able to still live on through his great mind and his work. And then of course, through you and, you know, just having these conversations that people weren't having, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago, or, you know, 40 years ago. Yes. Yeah. And I haven't solved everything. You know, he talked about harnessing cosmic rays. I haven't figured that one out yet. 
Um, <laughs> you haven't? <laughs> <laughs> but he's got, you know, he keeps you going, you know, he keeps you, you know, when, when I was teaching, I would give kids brain teasers and, uh, you know, I'd say, I want you to go out into the, the, the room, you know, out into the hall and I'd have, they'd be in different groups and see which of you can, can solve the brain teeth. Well, this is before, you know, uh, the, 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 the smartphone got so freaking smart, you know? <laughs> so then I'd have to say, you're not allowed to look this up on Google, you know? Um, and a lot of kids give up and other kids don't give up. And I'm asking, you know, the people that are watching, don't give up, you know, work on these things. It's important to, to keep the mind going, not just you know, Google the answer. And, and in fact, sometimes the answer is completely wrong. Um, I'll tell you a very funny story. Uh, my, my sister and, and brother-in-law came up one, one year and we were talking and they had listened to the book by Clifford Irving. Uh, Clifford Irving was, uh, had uh, forged uh, Howard Hughes's uh, handwriting and written a biography. And he said, Howard Hughes said, I can write his biography. And, how, and then only had heard from Howard Hughes in the last 10 years. And uh, McGroy Hill uh, gave uh, uh, Clifford Irving three hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, about 1980, uh, to write the autobiography of Howard Hughes. Well, after the book was in print, uh, they got a phone call. Hi, I'm Howard Hughes. I never met Clifford Irving. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. So we're talking about uh, this. So uh, uh, Mary and John said to me, "You know, it's too bad Clifford Irving is dead." Uh, and I said, no, he's not. I said, I, I use his handwriting, a graphology book. I wrote him and uh, he gave me permission to use his, his handwriting. And I said, no, it's uh, right here. We looked up, it's Google, he's dead. I said, here's the letter I just got from, from Clifford Irving, he's still alive. So this is the danger of the internet. The internet can have disinformation. We know that's been used by the Russians and all that other stuff too. But you have to be very careful. You have to be able to verify it. When I would give assignments to the kids, I'd say, sure, it's fine to use uh, Google and the internet, but I want to use real books too. We did psychohistories. And when you do your psychohistories, I want some of those sources to be actual books because you don't know. Sometimes information is just wrong and it gets multiplied over and over and over. Uh, uh, because of the power of the internet. Yeah. Wholeheartedly agree with that. It's, it's a interesting times, you know, that's why I got worried when the first, you know, device, well, one of the first devices to digitize books was called a Kindle that worried me a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't like the concept that it was uh, providing. I'm not about book burning. Um, <laughs> definitely not. I didn't like that. It was called a Kindle. Um, I've got to ask, with your handwriting analysis background, did you uncover anything, in your opinion, about Nikola Tesla based on some of these letters? Yes, I covered a lot. Um, one of the things about him is that he was celibate. He didn't have sex with anybody. Um, there's a question whether, whether he's homosexual or not. Um, he, whether he had homosexual tendencies, I don't know. Um, but he had friends of both sexes. Um, he was very, friends with a lot of women and a lot of men. His handwriting is just a handwriting of just a brilliant man. He was not screwed up. I mean, he just has a be beautiful, brilliant handwriting. Um, and so you look at the handwriting of a genius and and, and really is, uh, there's nothing wrong with the writing. So so all the speculation about how nutty he might be and you know, all his obsessions and what was he autistic and all that. No, he just was a fascinating, incredibly brilliant uh, individual. But his handwriting fell apart in 1906. And when I'm reading, you know, 40 years of his handwriting, I see it's falling apart in 1906. That's when J.P. Morgan really scuttles the deal and says, you know, I know you've tried to, you know, you've been writing me every letter for the last five or six years. Well, you can, you might as well forget it because I'm never going to give you the money. So just freaking forget it. And his handwriting falls apart. So I speculated that he had a nervous breakdown. No one knew about this nervous breakdown. Um, John O'Neill, who wrote the first biography of Tesla called Prodigal Genius, a great book, but it's got huge gaps that I fill in in, uh, in Wizard. Um, he didn't know uh, what happened, that he suffered like this. Um, no one knew. And the way I found out was through his handwriting. And what you can see is his signature. His signature is a his beautiful signature. And then in 1906, it just totally falls apart. And then in 1907, it loses all its panache. It's like he's coming out of this 
you know, this horrible time that he went through. And then over time, he gets back to his old, his old pattern. I think one of the interesting things that, that I thought about about Tesla, why didn't he commit suicide? Um, his, his dreams were dashed. What I, what I uncovered and what we uncovered during the, the making of the movie, uh, the television show, The Tesla Files, it's, it's a five-part limited series. We found tunnels underneath uh, a wooden cliff. These tunnels are 60 or 70 feet down. They're 100 feet long. And he has what's called earth grippers. These are the one to grip the earth. Tesla wants to send the energy through the earth, not through the air. That big mushroom top at the top is not for, to transmit. That's to collect the energy so it could be uh, driven down into the earth. So you've got this whole, you know, catacomb of, of uh, uh, systems. So he's got down 120 feet, the whole thing goes down. And then 70 feet down, he's got these giant rooms and so, so when you see the tower, the, the iconic picture of the Wardcliffe Tower, that's only part of it. So you can understand he's got this huge operation. He's going to change the entire planet, advance the world a century, get every single person on the planet their own cell phone in 1901. Uh, he talks about it the size of a wallet, he says. Um, you get the, the messages of, of you know the, around be like talking from here to Australia, like we're sitting across the room from each other. He mentions all of that stuff in 1904. Um, so you can understand he had so much invested in this, and he had to change the the mind of one man. I'm trying to advance the world a century, Mr. Morgan. Uh, please give me the money or release me from my my deal and allow Frick and, and Jacob Schiff to come in and give me the money I need. Why are you preventing this? Um, and Morgan doesn't. You can understand why he suffered so greatly. So he suffers greatly, but he comes out of it. A man who didn't come out of it was someone, one of his greatest uh, 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 protégés was uh, uh, Edwin Armstrong, the inventor of AM and FM radio. Um, some of you guys remember uh, on the radio, if you put the radio all the way over the dial, you can pick up television stations. Do you remember when that? Oh, you yeah. That? Well, the FM, it's the FM frequency that, that Armstrong invented that Sarnoff, who created NBC TV, usurped, took over and said, no, it's our invention. And Armstrong said, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, I invented it. You know, no, no, we invented it. Well, Armstrong and loses all of his money. He was a multimillionaire battling Sarnoff. He jumps out an 11 story window, uh, commits suicide in the early 1950s. Um, so there's a man who was driven to his own death. The fact that Tesla didn't commit suicide and that he lived for another 40 years and that he was negotiating his later life all the way through his mid eighties, through the highest echelons of power uh, throughout the world with the Soviet Union, Great Britain, Yugoslavia, United States, with Franklin Roosevelt and John McNaughton and the, and the others, uh, shows you what an incredible guy. And he talks about it in 1917 when he's uh, given the, the Edison medal, the irony of him getting the Edison medal. He talks about metamorphosis and he talks about the implication of life after death, that, that there's more to life than, than this physical world. There's what we you know live on and what we do, but we have to plan for the future too. And he implies the possibility there might be something beyond uh, uh, this life. So he had to have a transcendent nature to be able to, give up his baby, which was an unbelievable baby, and move on and keep going uh, for the next 40 years. Wow. Powerful. Just to be able to, like you said, like kind of let it go because, you know, it, it seemed like he just, I wonder if inherently he knew that it would still see the light of day because he can't change it. It's just going to eventually come to, come into fruition, I suppose. Maybe that was something. Yeah, I think he, he had comfort in that, knowing that it would come through. Uh, that is, you know, one of the things about him was he invented fundamentals. And when I taught, I tried to teach fundamentals. You know, I taught uh, psychology. You need to know what the ego, the superego, and the it are. There's a lot of, you know, people put Freud down, but boy, we sure live in a Freudian world. <laughs> um, and, you know, you have to understand the fundamentals. And his inventions are the basis and he said he saw himself basically as a farmer planting the seeds. You know, I plant the seeds and let, let you know, the other people 
uh, grow the plants afterwards. I'm, I'm going to plant the seeds, like Johnny Appleseed in the sense. I love that. It's so true. And uh, we're still, again, to this day, we're still seeing some of those things unfold. And I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I'd love to get your take. If you feel like, do you think that maybe there are some other patents or documents that just have not been released? He was working on a rainmaking machine. We're dealing right now today, uh, late September, um, you know, uh, 2022, of a huge hurricane uh, going through uh, Florida, uh, maybe devastating Florida. Um, he had a way to uh, break up tornadoes. Um, uh, President Trump suggested an atomic bomb, which of course was a ridiculous idea, but the concept of creating an explosion to break up a tornado, it was Tesla's idea. Um, and the same is probably true uh, with uh, hurricanes. We have the, uh, the jet stream. Um, I think that, you know, Tesla was trying to create rain. We had all these droughts, particularly in the West. How do you create rain? Um, he felt that our, you know, he, the last article in the book is Tesla's article in his own words. It's one or two pages. And the drawing, it's not in this particular book, but it's a, you have a baby and you have a balanced, uh, you know, balanced thing where, you know, so you have the baby here and all of man's creations here and the baby's brain is more powerful than all of man's creations, trains and airplanes and buildings and on and on and on. There's so much in here, you know, and I think that it's very possible that in the future we will be able to manipulate uh, the jet stream. Um, and if we can manipulate the jet stream, we could uh, reroute uh, hurricanes uh, to go out to sea uh, so that they don't, you know, devastate the land. Another thing, though, that occurred to me, and maybe you know the answer, because I can't figure this out. We have a swimming pool. It loses water. I put a ton of water in every day. When it rains, it's dropping so much water. How does it then continue on for hundreds of miles and continue to drop so much water? Where does all that water come from? Is it all up in the sky or is it drawing it up? I have no understanding at all of how a hurricane or rain, these gigantic rainstorms can have so much unbelievable amount of water up in the sky and then it falls down to the earth. You know, I've, I've written another book, which will come out in, uh, in March. It's called... Uh, ozone uh, therapy uh, for the treatment of viruses. Um, Tesla invented a, uh, an ozone generator. He, well, he knew that ozone uh, therapy would, would, would kill illnesses. They didn't know what a virus was until 1920. Uh, but uh, he understood that there was you know, that. And in studying, uh, we could have knocked out the COVID virus if, we, if, they, hadn't been, if they hadn't denigrated the ozone uh, therapists. That's what this is all about. But I, I don't want to talk about that so much. What I want to talk about is the, is the ozone layer. In, in studying my book, Ozone Therapy for the Treatment of Viruses, I studied the ozone layer. How thick do you think the ozone layer is, uh, Jay? Uh, just take, give me a wild guess. Up above the side. I wouldn't even be able to comprehend. <laughs> take a wild guess. I would, I would surmise it would be, are we talking like mileage of... of of thickness is that what we're going for yeah. we're going density i mean gosh i mean i would with my feeble mind i would say oh, let's go with 50 miles i don't okay. know 50 miles nothing too crazy <laughs> i would have guessed five or ten miles you're not going to believe what i'm going to tell you it's one or two millimeters thick Ooh. the ozone layer is one or two millimeters thick without the ozone layer there would be no life on the planet what ozone does, it's a different form of oxygen. It's O3 instead of O2. The cosmic rays hit the oxygen in the atmosphere every morning and change O2 into O3, and it rises up and creates the, the, the blue sky because it's a blue thing. It's this thick. That's how fragile life is on this planet. We live in an amazing, uh, miraculous world, and we need to take care of this thing. And I have chills right now talking about this. I mean, the hair standing on my head. How is that possible? How did if God or a creator, whatever you want to call it, this, this creative force allow this planet 
to be that fragile and still be so remarkable that this tiny little thing is what's protecting us. That's why it's so important that we have to protect, you know, the climate. But the reason I got there, the reason I learned that ozone therapy would have killed this COVID virus if, if they hadn't denigrated the ozone therapist to begin with, was because of Tesla. Because I went to a conference in 1984 that I spoke at, and there was a medical doctor there. His name was Dr. George Freebach. And the reason he was there is because Tesla invented the ozone generator. And he said, I had him, he was a medical doctor. He said, I had a man that was dying of cancer. His, his body was riddled with tumors. I injected him with a combination of 97% pure oxygen, 3% ozone, and the tumors were shed and he was cured. That was in 1984. I stuck it in, I stuck it in this book which was published in 1996, so 12 years later. That was it. And I forgot about it. 25 years go by, the COVID crisis hits, and I go, you know, that Dr. George Freebot, hmm, it stayed in here, you know, I cured cancer with the tumors. Let me look up the guy. So I Google his name, and out pops a book called uh, uh, the Story of Ozone by Saul Pressman, actually written by 12 medical doctors. Um, and uh, uh, it says, you know, that ozone kills viruses. I mean, and that it's perfectly safe. Ozone therapy is perfectly safe. And I go, what the heck is going on here? So Tesla has led me in so many different paths. Um, and I think he, he, you know, there is the movie, uh, which you may or may not have seen, uh, starring David Bowie called The Man Who Fell to Earth. It's about a Martian who lands on the earth who gives us all these inventions. It's a takeoff on Tesla's life. There was a book written in 1956 called Return of the Dove, written by a UFO nut. Her name was Margaret Storm. And she wrote this book, Return of the Dove, that Tesla was born on the planet Venus, that he came to the earth in 1956 to give us all these inventions. And then uh, Walter Tevis came along and changed it to uh, a Martian, a real Martian, and it became this whole thing. And uh, David Bowie was the perfect choice to play the Martian in the movie in 1976. Well, 30 years later, The Prestige comes along, and uh, there's Tesla in the, in the Prestige. So who do they choose to play Tesla but David Bowie? And the reason, of course, was paying homage to the man who fell to earth, which is really based on his life. The point I'm getting to is Tesla was not born on a different planet, but there is a mystical side to this guy. How did this guy come at the moment that he came to protect our atmosphere, give us all these inventions and still lead us now, even now leading us to a way to deal with emerging viruses. Um, the whole idea of avatars, enlightened beings, you know, I, I think there's a lot of truth to all of that. There's this other whole side to this. You know, it's a different way to look at uh, at Jesus. You know, uh, what are religions all you know based on? Um, are we really just alone? Or I, I, what I, what I ask myself is, where are we? Where is, uh, where is Mark, Mark Cipher? Where am I in the hierarchy of consciousness? I know I'm pretty smart, but I'm not, certainly wasn't the smartest kid in high school. There were kids that were always smarter than me. But is there something else that's smarter than us? And I, you know, I sit out by the pool and watch the, the, the dragonflies and I watch the bees, you know? And uh, one of the points I make in the new book, how come honey doesn't get uh, um, mold? You know, it's a sweet thing, you know? I have, uh, you know, with strawberries out there, they get rotten in about two days, right? They grow mold and, and your, your raspberries, boom. Why doesn't honey? Because the bees figured out of hundreds of millions of years how to produce an incredibly important sweet product that mold will not grow in. And the reason, of course, is that, you know, it has a touch of hydrogen peroxide in there that they, that they generate. And our body produces hydrogen peroxide. Our body produces ozone. Uh, Paul Wentworth uh, discovered that in 2001. That's how we kill, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the COVID virus. Uh, they never tell you how the, the antibody, how these vaccines work. They say, take the vaccine, you'll be cured. Well, what's happening. <laughs> the reason that, that we're being cured is our body is killing off the virus and it's, we're getting a head start is what the virus looks like. And the way it's killing it is producing hydrogen peroxide and ozone, the same thing that the bees are doing. 
So what I'm trying to say is, if we look at nature, we look at the world around us, um, and be humble, you know, is there intelligence beyond us? I'm telling you, the bees are smarter than we are. We can't come up with a, a way to create a sweet product that won't get moldy, but a bee can do it. Um, look at the hummingbird, how it hovers, you know, um, just on and on and on, just nature itself. Uh, so I can mother nature, you know. So there is obviously a more intelligent force responsible for life, you know, DNA. You know, it's only four bases that, that control all of life. The only difference between me and the oak tree outside is the combination of those four bases in a different arrangement. I mean, it's astounding. Um, but there's an intelligence out there. How can we tap into that? So some people call it God, you know. Uh, but one way or another, it's tapping into that. And I think, you know, he, one way or another, he was sent here. You know, one way or another, he was sent here uh, to wake us up. Another example of that for me uh, was the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, above London was a double rainbow. Um, again, I get chills and it's a very sad story, but I had a, a nephew who, who died suddenly. He was 12 years old. Oh. A beautiful boy. His name was Bentley. My condolences. And uh, it was 10 years ago. And we went to uh, his funeral. And above the chapel was a double rainbow. Well, that was 10 years ago. So when I saw the double rainbow above London when Queen Elizabeth died, I mean, you know, talk about a sign. I mean, there's something beyond this world, you know? Um, and, and it's opening up to that other other thing uh, that is so important. And he's, you know, one of the one of the uh, guideposts uh, that constantly triggers something in your head that you you know you keep going on and enlightens you. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm so glad that even to this moment in time, Nikola Tesla is still inspiring many. <laughs> yeah. and I'm grateful for individuals like yourself that keep that legacy going and teaching others and bringing it on through the ages. So thank you, Mark, for all your hard work and all your passion and what you bring to all of us. Well, thanks, Jay. Um, I, uh, I think your podcast is tremendous. I think that it's whole new platform is such a great thing. Um, it's, it's what it's all about. You know? it truly is. Frequency and vibration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So how can folks find you, Mark? Well, uh, you know, it's uh, markcypher.com. Um, I really hope you guys, uh, you know, uh, get my new book, uh, Tesla Wizard at War. Um, it's a great read. I keep reading it uh, because, uh, you know, there's a little minor corrections. I got it in the hardcover, you know, we'll fix it in the soft cover. Um, but I like just reading it. I, I, uh, I, it, 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 uh, there's so much in there and I really, I didn't just bring to life World War II. I bring to life World War I and also the Spanish American War, but well, but I also bring to life, I found connections that Tesla had to people that he's never been connected to before, like William Randolph Hearst, a Citizen Kane, the original Citizen Kane, uh, Lewis Comfort, Tiffany, Tiffany Lamp and all that. He was good friends with Tiffany, um, and uh, uh, Theodore Dreiser, uh, who, who wrote uh, uh, many uh, books, which uh, you know became uh, uh, these, these movies. The one that Lady Gaga was in recently. Um, uh, I can't think of the name. Yeah, me neither. But I know the one you speak of. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's all based on Theodore Dreiser. So I found connections to Tesla to other people you've never been connected to before. Um, and I love the er the era of uh, you know. Uh, the gay 90s. Uh, I have a partner, Tim Eaton, worked for Lucas Films for 20 years. We've been, uh, we have screenplay, we're trying to get uh, the funding to make a movie. I just think, you know, I think it's a, it's such a fascinating story and, and his life interacted with so many amazing people, you know, Rudyard Kipling and uh, uh, Mark Twain, mm -hmm. Stanford White, the great architect. Um, and, you know, J.P. Morgan, I don't just look at him as a bad guy. He was an amazing guy. I mean, they were all multidimensional people. They were all flawed. But, uh, there's so many characters in his life. Even Sarah Bernhardt, you know, was, was a friend of Tesla's. Um, so uh, so we're trying to get a film made. Um, 
and you know just keep going i i look forward to that and it's gonna happen putting it out there okay <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> it's gonna happen and i look forward to being able to view that and remember this moment in time in this space where we have this conversation yes yes you know that, that is an important thing let me say one more thing before we end this of course um, when i got a computer which was in about 1984 or something like that. It was a Tandy Radio Shack computer. I put it on my table and I walked to the door and I stood in the door and I said, I wanna remember this moment. I wanna look at that computer and remember that this is a whole new thing that I never had this before because I know eventually it's gonna be every day, you know, you're gonna take it like it's just a random thing, but to take that moment. And I think it's very important what you just said is for us to stand back at times, at, that, at important times, and remember that moment because we get so caught up, you know, in life. So I have that memory. Um, I wouldn't have had that memory had I not literally, you know, physically brought myself to the door and said, I want to remember this moment when this is amazing that I have a computer. And in those days, if you could put, I think 80 pages was the most you could put on a, on a computer. You couldn't, you couldn't put one picture on there, one picture, forget it. You didn't have enough space to put one picture on. Uh, you could put 80 pages and you had to be careful if you uh, eliminated words, you had to, the way you, you would keep some of the letters because if you eliminate the whole word, <laughs> would actually lose even more space. Uh, that's the world that, that we started out in. And there you have it. I can't thank Mark enough for all his time and his energy. The amount of hours of research that you've done, Mark. Thank you so much. If you'd like to find out more information on Mark Cipher, go to markcipher.com. And that's M-A-R-C-S-E-I-F-E-R, Mark Cipher. We touched upon a little bit about Mark's new book that's coming out, which I'm actually holding in my hand right now. It's called Ozone Therapy for the Treatment of Viruses. It's available for pre-order now, and it's coming out this March. So be sure to check that out wherever you buy your books. If you're watching the podcast, we sure hope you're subscribed to the channel and hit that notification bell so you can find out about our new bi-weekly releases. If you're listening, please take a moment and rate the podcast. We're still a new podcast, believe it or not, after a year, but we still need you to help reach other people. So if you know any like-minded individuals that enjoy this kind of content, please take a moment and share our podcast with them. Until next time, take care of one another and keep thinking for yourself.